www.newenglandpublicmedia.org. For generations, New England Public Media has been a trusted and treasured institution across Western New England. Your ongoing support has made a real difference in your community, ensuring that every resident has access to in-depth reporting, educational children's programming, Terrific. smart, engaging local stories, and inspiring music and drama. We have liftoff! If you've received a membership reminder, please renew your commitment to NEPM or go to NEPM.org. Thank you. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. I volunteered for missions. It was just too exciting. Beware what you wish for. That's when the ambush starts. It's important for people to hear these stories, to understand why and when and where we send our sons and daughters to go and fight. American Veteran, October 26, or at NEPM.org. Coming up, stories we're connecting you with tonight. We celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month by exploring local music and poetry. We're always trying to connect uh, with our souls, our bodies, our minds, and we're never really just one thing. We'll learn more about an opportunity for young people to tackle inequities through the art of filmmaking. Our young people have opinions. They definitely have opinions about how we got here, and they have opinions about how we can get out of it. And we'll pay a visit to a perennial favorite fall attraction, the Franklin County Fair. We had our best year ever. I mean, record crowds at every spot we've done this year. We're just so thankful that the people are happy to be back at the fairs, too. We'll bring you those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Good evening, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Brian Sullivan, in for Zydalise Bauer. Diana Alvarez is an expansive multimedia artist and educator. Her soulful music is bilingual, and she says the intent behind her original songs is to exalt queer love, liberation, and fiercely sing out against oppression. She grew up in South Texas, but now calls the Pioneer Valley her home. And producer Dave Fraser brings us her story. For a long time in my life, I knew that I was, a, I was a singer, I was a vocalist and a writer. And I knew I wanted to write songs. And eventually I realized, and it was because of, you know, losing family that I, I realized I needed to center art in my world. And I needed to do that in a way that felt um, that my whole self was being part of the practice. Well, I don't really identify with the word Hispanic. Um, it is a term of, that was given to us in colonization. Uh, and I identify as a, a Chicana, a Chicanex human, um, a person of Mexican-American ancestry. I was just finishing my MFA program at Sarah Lawrence College. I was, I was working on an MFA in writing, and I came out here with my first queer love, and we were looking at this area as a, as a queer haven. And it, I, I was really excited by what I had heard was a vibrant art scene. What a difference a day made. I work in multiple mediums as a singer-songwriter, as a poet, composer, filmmaker, and I'm also a scholar and, and educator. But really what it means is I sit down and I try to create an experience where I'm connecting to other humans because we have bodies. We're, we're always trying to connect uh, with our souls, our bodies, our minds, and we're never really just one thing. Um, so it's just my way of being honest about it. I use that word as, as my stage name, Doctora Chingona. Um, one, because I want other people to know that PhD scholars can be, can look like me and can do all the things I do and can, can be artistic and that we have a right to call ourselves badasses for everything we do. <laughs> you are the sound of 
I worked with a composer named Pauline Oliveros who taught me to use a room as an instrument. So every space we go into is going to have a different reverberation time and different material for or sounds to bounce off of. And so when I enter any space, I think it's become more of an intuitive thing to kind of work with the, the space and to listen as I'm singing. I feel like these very profound life lessons have come from just walking. And it started as a grief practice when I lost family. I started going out to hike um, early in the morning and just, you know, trying to connect um, with the land. And I think there's something about the way that our full body is engaged. We're sweating, our blood is flowing. It really shifts something for me internally and spiritually. You know, when I go for a hike, I, you know, right after often I'll start writing, I'll just do a free write. Cuando vuelve a in 2020 we were playing virtually so much and I would put so much energy into a video or into a virtual show and sometimes there would be people in the chat and that was great but many times it was like putting all this energy out into and it would just fall flat so I try to hold on to those moments where people would tell me how much it meant to them because at the end of the day we're I'm not just creating for myself to listen to myself. I'm, I'm really trying to reach other humans. I love, I love. All month long, NEPM and Connecting Point continue to celebrate the rich diversity of Latino culture right here in Western New England. Music lovers can tune in this Sunday, October 3rd at 6 p.m. as NEPM Radio 88.5 FM presents El Puerto Rico 4, featuring a selection of music from Puerto Rican composers. And you can find more stories of the creativity, culture, and communities that make up the Latino experience in our region online at nepm.org slash connecting point. Springfield Poet Laureate Magdalena Gomez was just 17 years old when she first publicly performed in Greenwich Village in New York City. Her career as a poet, playwright, educator, activist, and more has garnered numerous awards, accolades, and recognition, including recently being awarded with an Academy of American Poets Fellowship. Her mission to provide others with tools for self-determination has also led her to tour nationally as a keynote speaker and become co-founder and artistic director of Teatro Vida, the first Latino theater in Springfield. Gomez joined Zydalise Bauer in a conversation about her journey and her latest ventures. I discovered it in the public library at Hunts Point in the South Bronx where I grew up and I discovered poetry there and I fell in love with it and started writing it when I was like eight years old. And then finally at 17, I had a mentor. Her name was Emily Glenn. She is one of the most widely published unknown poets in the United States. <laughs> and she said, I have a feature for you. It's time. And I was 17 and still in high school. In the artist statement on your website, it says, quote, I grew up hard, I love harder. You have mentioned in past interviews that you didn't always have a voice growing up and that you actually had to fight hard to have one. How were you able to eventually find your voice and how has that inspired or influenced your work that you do today? Poetry reading was pivotal. I think that was an important moment because I read my work and I got such a loving response from the audience. And I just felt seen, I felt alive. And in that moment, I felt as if my words mattered. You have gone all over the country as a keynote speaker. You have been an educator. How did that transition happen that it was really this moment that you found your voice to now this is who you are in your career? Well, I think that people should never underestimate the influence that they have on children, whether it is for a moment or uh, a lifetime or for years. Uh, a few things happened along the way. My third grade teacher cast me as Walt Disney in the school play. And I loved gender bending, even at that age. 
because I always felt that I was more than male or female and that everyone was and that our souls were so big that we didn't fit into any identity. So I felt very comfortable playing Walt Disney <laughs> in my little suit and tie. And then I had a fifth grade teacher who said to me, my dear, you were born for the theater. And then I had another professor in college, Al Bermel, and he said to me, you were born for the theater. And so all these people who just for a moment or just for a short time gave me words of encouragement, made all the difference in the world. And that has really made a difference because you've been named as the 2019 to 2021 Poet Laureate for the city of Springfield. You also have received um, an Academy of American Poets Fellowship. So congratulations on both of those honors. Thank you. But I know it's more, being a Poet Laureate is more than just an honor. It carries a responsibility to the city. So can you elaborate on that responsibility? It is being Poet Laureate. Absolutely. It was very difficult for me because of the pandemic. So I started a podcast called Jazz Ready because you have to be jazz ready in life because you never know what's coming. So in that podcast, I originally did it for the city of Springfield and we now have a global audience and it features poetry, but then it started to grow into the poetry of music the poetry of theater, the poetry of public speaking. Now, as I was mentioning before, um, the Academy of American Poets Fellowship um, that you received this year, what type of work are you planning to do as a fellow with that grant? Uh, I'm going to be in a collaboration with the Springfield Public Library. I've been in conversation with Jean Canosa Albeno, and uh, we are preparing uh, a series of workshops that I'm going to be facilitating for women and girls in, in, in amplifying their voices, in creating tools of self-determination for them to bring up their own voices through poetry writing and poetry reading. And it's going to culminate in a performance. Now, in an interview with Holyoke, Holyoke Media, you, you stated that you do not separate art from activism or art from the human connection. Why has activism been so important for you? And why do you feel that these two should not be separated? I was born into it. Uh, both of my parents came from poverty and oppression. My father was Gitano. And I think that people understand that Gitanos are among the most oppressed and marginalized people globally, not just the Spanish Gitanos from Andalusia, but Gitanos from all over the world. And my mother grew up, uh, you know, as a victim of the thrashing of Puerto Rico by colonialism, and she grew up in poverty. And I grew up with two storyteller parents who shared stories from their lives. And I heard about this oppression. And from the time I was a little girl, there were two things that mattered to me, which was giving opportunity for voice to others who had been silenced, like my parents, like myself. So my two parents were both extremely artistic without the opportunity to express that. So, and my mother could not read or write until she was 60 years old. So I've dedicated my life to interrupting those patterns in the lives of others. For me, it's important that other people find their voice, their power, their creative spirit. And that's why I can't separate it from activism because to me, the soul of activism is providing opportunities for others to be their best selves so that they can make our society better. You make it a point to um, state that you do not empower anyone. It's not a word that you are a fan of. Why is that the case? Um, and what do you hope people take away from your work and career as a poet, playwright, and author? Um, the reason I don't like the word empower, because there's, I think, an implication there that somehow, somehow we are giving power to others. And I don't believe that my role as an artist or a human being is to think that I can be the voice for other people. My job is to provide venue for them, which is why I started Jazz Ready, why I started Teatro Vida, why I started Ignite the Mic and all of those venues here in Springfield, because I believe that it's my job as an artist, not only to amplify myself, but to create the tools for others to amplify themselves.
And Magdalena Gomez graciously shared some of her powerful work with us, reading her poem, Literate Hands, in a special Connecting Point digital exclusive. Beads strung on sinew and fibrous plants. Then there was faience from the crushing of quartz, the crushing of sand. Beads for the marking of time, beads of music, beads of rhyme, beads of prayer and meditation, beads of trade and exaltation. You can find Magdalena's reading online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. While there's been plenty of attention given to the return of the Eastern States Exposition in West Springfield this fall, there was another festival that took place recently after a year's absence due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In early September, Greenfield hosted the 172nd Franklin County Fair, and I paid a visit to bring you the sights and sounds of this perennial favorite fall attraction. As summertime in New England draws to a close, so too does the season for the Traveling County Fair. And in any other year, this whole seasonal transition likely would have taken place without anyone so much as batting an eye. Prior to 2021, the Franklin County Fairgrounds in Greenfield had hosted the event 171 times, so people had grown as accustomed to the fair being here as they are to the sun coming up in the morning. Then 2020 happened, and large gatherings like this one were put on hold until further notice. Well, that until further notice date arrived on Thursday, September 9th, and ran through Sunday the 12th, and the crowds arrived with it, along with the chance to get up close and personal with some local farm animals or to just sit back and enjoy some live music. Of course, the fair is always accompanied by the bells, whistles, and visuals that can only be found in this setting. But it's also a place for some local vendors to sell their wares. And unlike some of the bigger fairs, many of them are part of a much smaller regional circuit. For Cliff Smoke and Backyard Barbecue, who traveled about 15 miles east to get here from the town of Buckland, it's a chance to expand their already existing fan base. We look forward to it, absolutely, and the community looks forward to it every year. We, even throughout the year, we have people come up to us, are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? Are you going to be in the same place? Absolutely. And that consistency in location goes a long way, not only for the fair goers, but for the vendors themselves. This spot has been ours for 25 years, so it was my parents before it was mine, and then now it's mine. Um, when I purchased the booth from my parents, it became mine. So a lot of um, a lot of these spots, as you can see, I'm right up in the front. Are, it's really good, um, but we've earned our, our way here, and that's how it goes at a lot of the other fairs, too. That earning can be done by showing consistency in a quality product, paying rent on time, showing up on time, and just following the basic rules of the carnival. Kerry is a fourth-generation vendor, and after a life of covering fairs in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts, those years of service and dedication have resulted in some front-of-the-house real estate. If visitors don't stop on the way in, there's a good chance they'll stop on the way out. Then there are the structures that don't get carted away when all is said and done, like the old Marine Corps burger house that looks like it's been here since there was dirt on the ground. There might be new owners running the shack these days, but the fact that burgers and dogs are a very popular staple in the county fair atmosphere has never changed. Turns out that wasn't exactly common knowledge for the new management team when they bought the place a couple of years ago. It's kind of funny, the first year that we did this, we had no idea what to expect. We went out and we bought, you know, you know, 50 hamburgers and 50 hot dogs and we were running around like crazy. We were going to BJ's and everywhere. At, to buy more because we were selling at it. We had no idea how fast it was going to sell. It was so popular. For countless generations, the county fair has been a major part of the American experience, almost a rite of passage for many kids, like the thrill of finally meeting the height requirement to get on certain rides, finding out the hard way that it's nearly impossible to get a ring to land on one of these bottles, or learning that nearly every ride is designed to spin its participants six ways to Sunday, even adults find out firsthand that most of these games aren't as easy as they made them look in the old cartoons. <laughs> Man, 20 bucks later and I finally got to hit the bell. For the most part, this fair has everything I'd expect to find. Local flavor, food, rides, games, but there is one special attraction that I'm sticking around for tonight. For 
anyone who's never witnessed a demolition derby, even one heat is worth the price of admission. The ability to take out a year's worth of frustrations by smashing junkyard jalopies into smithereens must be one of the most cathartic experiences ever. The packed seats tell me that it's just as much of a thrill for the fans in the stands as well. It may not be the Indy 500, but after enduring the year of 2020 and all it entailed, it may as well have been. In fact, if there's any truth to the proverb that absence makes the heart grow fonder, it was on full display at this fair and other fairs throughout the region. It's been really good. I just came out of a spot and we had our best year ever. I mean, record crowds at every spot we've done this year. Um, we're just so thankful that the people are happy to be back at the fairs, too. And let's not discount the heartwarming effect of the fair's nostalgia. I came here as a kid, and I came to this booth and got hamburgers as a kid. I mean, it's always been here, you know, so coming come full circle around, and then I see my friends and their kids, and they're coming over, and it's great, you know, and my kids, and hopefully maybe someday my son will be doing the same thing. Every Friday night, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. But it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. Fall is officially in the air in Western Massachusetts, and we're celebrating by sharing a look at some of the sights and sounds of our favorite season. Don't miss this digital exclusive video essay available online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. There's an exciting opportunity underway for young aspiring filmmakers residing or attending school in the Berkshire Taconic region. The Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative has partnered with the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation and the Civic Life Project to present Bridging Divides, Healing Communities Youth Film Challenge. Now through November 1st, the challenge invites teens and young adults, ages 14 to 24, to create a short film of six minutes or less that tackles a specific problem or inequity. Elise Bauer spoke with Diane Perlman, Executive Director of the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative, to learn more. I got a call from Peter Taylor, the head of Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation, because they were doing a whole series of lectures for adults around the Bridging Divide Healing Communities Initiative. And Peter called and said, what do you think about doing something for young people? And uh, the Civic Life Project run by um, uh, Catherine and Dominique uh, had been in existence prior. They had actually done a film competition for young people right before the election, um, having them do films about civics. So it was sort of a great um, partnership between the three of us. This challenge is targeted for individuals who are aged 14 to 24 years old. And the prompt is to think about how to address global problems and inequities, either in your community or beyond. Why was it important for you to engage young people with this challenge? And why was this chosen as the focus for the prompt? Our young people are very engaged in all of the topics, whether it's homelessness or refugees or global warming or LBTGQ plus issues. So we're very excited to see what people come up with. In an article for the Berkshire Edge, you said, quote, it's very important to give a voice to young people right now. Talk about how digital storytelling can be an effective communication tool. I think digital storytelling is the effective communication tool going forward. And, you know, uh, I think that it's the older people that have to catch up with the younger people in some ways. They know how effective social media is. They know they are watching films, complete films on their phones where some of us are like, well, why aren't you going to a movie theater? They're just used to getting their news, their entertainment on a phone or a laptop or an iPad. It's just the way that they operate. How does this tra um, challenge translate into real life career skills for the participants, whether they wanna pursue a career in media or not? There are just some basics that we're teaching, how to tell a good story. That's what I'm finding is the biggest challenge for everyone, right? How do you tell a short story that's effective? Part of the other thinking was to offer these workshops in editing and how to shoot an interview and what is B-roll. I think we're at a point where if organizations, nonprofits, or even for-profit companies are going to use social media, they are going to need to know how to tell a good story. And so these are uh, skills that our young people can acquire now and learn from our professionals in the region.
as you mentioned, the deadline is November 1st. What will the selection process be like and what can the winners expect? We have a panel of distinguished judges, professionals that are in the industry that will be judging the films. The top three winners will receive cash prizes. Uh, we will probably select those winners from a pool of five, uh, five or six finalists. And those finalists will have their films screened at three area theaters and participate in Q and A's and possibly panel. And I think it's a great way for our young people to really get their, their voice out there in the community. I think another great thing about this challenge is that it's going to create a nice pool of local candidates for local media or organizations to pull from, and they'll have that life experience through this project. I think there are a lot of organizations that would take on interns who have this kind of experience, whether they come on board for a nonprofit to help with social media, um, whether they want to go into journalism and they call you for, <laughs> for an internship. I think our young people know this, that uh, social media is not going away. It's how people are doing their marketing and communication, whether it's through donors, um, you know, whether you're uh, using video to train employees. And so I think what we're offering young people are just some skills, more skills to become more facile in a medium that they're already pretty good at. As the executive director of the Berkshire Film and Media Collaborative, what would you love to see come out of this challenge? I'm excited to see some really great films. I'm excited to see what issues are important to our young people in the region. I think it isn't just to tell what the problems are, but for them to possibly come up with solutions. I think we need to listen to our young people. They are in tune with what's going on in the world and they have opinions. And uh, I think we should offer them a seat at the table. That does it for Connecting Point for October 1st, 2021. Remember, you can always find the stories you saw tonight as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. And please be sure to join us again next Friday night at 6 p.m. right here on New England Public Media for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Brian Sullivan in for Zydalise Bauer. Thanks for watching and have a great evening. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Meet Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony winner Rita Moreno, who found her good times after difficult ones. I was treated like a sex object. Look for Rita Moreno, just a girl who decided to go for it. Unspeakably 